Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Tamsin Rose and I have the great pleasure to be your moderator for this session. And we're going to be joining the dots to understand how the European health data space could work for rare diseases. I'm delighted that we have an audience here in the room and also joining us in the online stream. I'm going to invite those of you who are here in the room to come a little bit closer just to make it feel a little bit more friendly. So if you're hanging out at the back, please come and join us. The value of rare, if you put them all together, we get more people and we get more knowledge points. So just a couple of points about what we're going to do and how we're going to engage with you. We're going to be using Slido like the rest of the conference. And just as a reminder, you need to go to slido.com and use the hashtag moon. And we're going to be inviting you to engage with us at various different points. So the European health data space, it's an ambitious idea, but what exactly is it? How might it work? And in our session, we're going to try and get into some of the concrete aspects about how it might work, and particularly how we bridge the, to something called real-world data. We talk about it a lot, but what does that mean in practice? And we're going to look from a number of different perspectives. We're going to hear from patients and the clinicians who treat them in the rare disease area to understand how data is useful for them and what they hope it could deliver for the way that they work together. We're going to hear from industry to see how they want to use data, how it could be a driver for innovation. And we're going to be here from, from regulators and policymakers who are looking at how data will give them greater insight into their health systems. So the health data space is both a political goal and an element in the European Health Union, but it's also a legislative proposal that's been put forward by the European Commission and is now currently being addressed by our two co-legislators, the European Parliament and the European Council. So it's still in process. It is both a direction of travel and a clear foundation to make a, an understanding of how our health systems could collaborate together. Because it's such a clear priority to make the data work for our health systems, we are going to be building on the work of the French presidency, which held different conferences looking at the European health data space and rare disease earlier this year, and the Czech presidency, which is already halfway through. And in October, they have a specific event on rare diseases. And we find ourselves between those two events. And we'll also have a little taste of what might be coming under the Swedish presidency to see how they want to take the idea forward. So, we have an online audience and a physical audience. I have physical guests and I have online speakers who will be joining. And this will be part of our conversation. And you, our audience, are important to the way we understand the process going forward. So the first thing we're going to ask you to do is we're going to ask, I'm going to launch a word cloud. And the question we're asking you, what springs to mind when you hear the term European health data space? It's one of those things that could mean Everything and nothing. Everyone has a different interpretation. But in your mind, when you hear that word, European health data space, what comes to mind? And we're starting to see already some images coming forward. And the clear winner at the moment in the center is research. And that's interesting, because when we talk about real world data, we want to see how to use it in everyday practice. So take it out of the research environment and bring it into the lab bedside. So we're also getting messages about complexity digital literacy and interoperability, access and the benefits to patients, the connectedness and the GDPR, and I'm sure we'll touch on some of these issues. But now we're starting to have in the middle the importance of collaboration. And that's clearly going to be something that's key. So just to get you a, a sense, and we'll, we'll put that up on screen in a minute, the EHDS, as I said, it's a direction of travel, it's a political goal, it is something, it's a bit like a moonshot in the sense that if we can make it work, it could deliver extraordinary benefits in our understanding of health, human health, and also of health systems. But there is enormous challenges. Our health systems and our data is fragmented, it's challenging, there are issues of control and ownership, there are questions about how the different data is collected, and anyone will tell you who has ever put together a database if you have poor quality data, you get poor quality results. So it relies on a chain of quality control all the way throughout. So there are many different aspects of the European health data space that we're going to explore. 
So there we have on our screen our word cloud. So collaboration and interoperability right at the heart of it with a clear message that improved patient outcomes is what we're looking to deliver. So I'm delighted to invite the first speaker to come and join me. And that's Richard Bergström, the vaccine coordinator for the Ministry of Health and Social Affairs of Sweden, and somebody also has a long background working also in industry and other environments. And we're going to find out a little bit more about what this means. So let, let's talk most recently, COVID-19. The vaccine came along. We didn't know anything about it because it's a brand new vaccine. We clearly needed data to make key decisions. So can you open that black box for us and give us some insight? You know, what are the learnings from your experience in Sweden and also in Europe about that process of selecting the vaccine and deciding how to use it? Because data was key. Give us some insight. Yes, no, thank you, Tamsin. It's a, a pleasure to be uh, here. Um, no, indeed. I mean, what just happened? I ask myself sometimes, and many others. Uh, there's another session in Gerstein going on right now about access to medicines, and you know, I'm sure they will be debating the fact that Europe did a joint procurement. We, we're not using that legal instrument, but you know, Europe got together and bought vaccines and didn't push down the prices to be rock bottom. You know, some people are making a lot of money, and I keep saying that's actually good because it sends a signal to others for the future. You know. So this tells me, uh, somewhat philosophical maybe, but in the spirit of the whole theme of, of Gastein this year, is that Europe can do things when it wants to. COVID certificates, the same thing. Wow. We don't even have interoperability of, of prescriptions. I don't know how many countries are part of this system now, but it's a handful or maybe a dozen. You know, and we fix the COVID certificate in months. And even works outside. I live in Switzerland, even though I'm Swedish. And it works there as well. It works everywhere. You know? So both getting together and buying vaccines for everybody with a broad portfolio, taking the risk, hedging the bets, and you know, I'm glad we did. Uh, you know, many people didn't believe in the vaccines we use now, the mRNA vaccines. You know? So I think, Tamsin, this is the big learning, is that when, when Europe really has its eyes on something, they can do it. And I believe that this European health data space could definitely be such a space, even if maybe the Commission's proposals are a bit ambitious to some extent. But, and as you said, pointed out, it's a co-decision procedure, so this is just a proposal. Thanks. What could we expect from the upcoming Swedish presidency? I know that they may not have published their plans yet, but maybe you could give us some insight into the thinking. Well, as you know, uh, Tamsin, and, and many people in the room, that it's not that you start with a blank sheet of paper when you inherit the presidency. You know, you inherit a lot of things. You know, first you are a part since quite some time. We have this, this, uh, this trio or troika concept, okay, where, where member states team up on an agenda. And of course, Sweden is at the tail of the, of the trio of France, uh, the Czech Republic, and now Sweden. So of course, we, we have to move along the things that we've agreed upon. So for instance, relevant for this panel now, there is a conference, I think, coming up in the Czech Republic now in October on rare diseases. So if something comes out of that, I don't know if what they're planning, if they will have council conclusions or something. Of course, you know, the Swedish government would have to pick up on that. We also have the, uh, the files, obviously, uh, the dossiers. You know, this mm -hmm. is one, European Health Data Space. Uh, we also expect that the European Commission, uh, DG Sante, will come with a, let's see how ambitious it will be, but there's going to be a whole review of the pharma legislation, including a life science strategy, which many of the, my, my, my colleagues, I say, still in the industry are somewhat nervous about. So the Swedish government will actually have its, its plate full of initiatives. But, but, you know, key thing is that the trio of, of presidencies um, also launched this, this uh, term of, you know, the, the, the uh, digitization, de decade of digital, a digital decade, uh, which I think is also something the Commission President uh, is really embodying, you know, she's really driving this everywhere, European data strategy in all sectors, right? So I don't think, um, I personally hope that the Swedish government will do something on antimicrobial resistance and on global health following the pandemic, uh, I, think, I think that will happen. There is no firm plan because we, we asked, well, actually we don't have a government, we have an interim government, we had elections last week, so, so right now it's in a bit of a flux, and that's the explanation also why there is no detailed uh, uh, plan. Um, but certainly the government will move along these files that are already uh, you know, moving on. 
Okay, Richard, let, let's try and understand with the European Health Data Space, of course, this is something where the regulators uh, are, are setting the framework. They're setting up the skeleton, the bones of the structure. But what's the role of stakeholders, whether they're people who are generating data, providing data, want to use data? What's their input to this vision of the European Health Data Space? It's going to be extremely important. Um, and, and that's why you know, I emphasize that this is a proposal from the Commission. Um, if I, and I just compare three files or pieces of legislation, uh, GDPR, you know, uh, which uh, where Europe has, I think, uh, probably the best safeguards in the world. Uh, um, and then we have the whole AI space, which also things are moving along, which is an area where both those areas are areas where you maybe didn't have so many entrenched systems and interests and vested interests and players in the countries. So therefore, the likelihood of an ambitious, expansive proposal from the EU level is more likely to work. This is completely different. I mean, I've been involved in that set of FPI. I was on the board of IMI. Many of the projects we have now, Eden, they do this OMOP mapping. Um, big data for better health, better outcomes, all these programs, you know, I've, I've learned firsthand how difficult it is because there are people that have spent their careers, maybe even mo and money, on curating, fixing, standardizing data. The idea that people would just show up and confiscate it, it's, it's, it's not going to work, right? Uh, we have prevailing concerns about privacy, we have prevailing concerns about backtracking re-identifying people, so we still have the whole GDPR space, you know, to, to, to worry about, right? So, so I think we are dealing with multiple um, data holders, and I'm sure we're going to come back to that with the other panelists, a number of data holders that definitely will have to be involved, and, and they, by default they will be involved, because if, if they're not listened to, they're going to shout and scream. So I think we're going to have a, quite a lively debate uh, the coming years, at not the least at the national level, about what are the you know, appropriate frameworks, like these, these, these data access bodies. I mean, somewhat controversial to many people. So, so, I, so I think it's definitely going to be, it will have to be a, a co-creation uh, procedure with, with lots of, uh, lots of changes. Um, also reflecting the nature that we have private players, we have, as I said, academic. If we take Sweden, for example, we have all these quality registries, patient registries, um, and, and, and we're very proud of them. And, I, I think maybe they're not as good as you think sometimes, but okay, we have a few really good ones, which everybody goes to, like the FDA, the EMA, they go, for instance, and look at the, the uh, TNF alpha, the biologics in RA, you know, a fantastic cohort of people you can study, and a few other examples. Um, uh, so, so you have, and those registries, you know, and those are very, very important um, sources, extremely important sources, but then to connect them with, let's say, the national prescribing registries for you know, what medicines people are taking, and then to connect that with electronic health records. Uh, this is it's not easy, right? And you have the whole this complexity in every country, and now all these people will somehow have to be buying into a whole new era of secondary use of data. You know, I mean, it's, when I hear myself speak, I think, wow, oh my God, this is going to be a big debate. <laughs> Richard, I mean, you, you've obviously been immersed in this for a while. Can you give us a sense of what does success look like? If you think about the European health data space, and let's hope it, we can make it a success, what does that look like for you? Can you give us an image or a concept that we can understand? Well, I think if, I, if we look back at it, I said two things, if you allow me, okay? One was an anecdote or, a, or an episode where I uh, organized a meeting uh, for uh, all the pharma CEOs, or most of them. And we had a, a dinner speaker from the European Commission, from Digi Justice, the one behind the GDPR, when it was the mo as most controversial. And he said somewhat uh, pointedly, one day you will thank me. You know, I, actually I ran into him a year later and I said, well, I thank you now, because the things that appeared in China, not to, I mean, even in the US, you know, how people are using data, you know, I think the safeguards are there. Um, so I, I think what, what, is, what, is, uh, what is important here is that we, we, we learn from misuses of data around the world. Uh, we learn from that and inspired by GDPR, maybe controversial to say this, but I say it, I think we should really build on that success. 
in doing something uh, something uh, similar. And another uh, episode was when when the UK government said every NHS patient is a research patient. I mean, sorry, but that was we were very happy in the pharma industry when we heard that, but the outcry, yep. you know. But the day comes in when saying that, and it's natural. And, and the Sun and the Daily Mirror will not run these stories about you know, how they're abusing your data. The day when it's natural that, that researchers, including pharma companies, can actually use the data to advance science, you know, that's the goal, but maybe I'm a bit naive here. Th that's your vision of success, then when the use of data is, is uncontroversial. It's uncontroversial. Every, every, every person is a research mm -hmm. person, you can say, right? Uh, but then the real, and I don't think pharma is the big issue here. I don't think uh, life science companies represented at this meeting uh, are, is the issue. P people understand you have to develop devices and, and drugs and so on. I think the issue is that all the other people that <coughs> want to do apps and things you hold on your <coughs> arm and things where, where, where they don't have the same inclination maybe for privacy as, as we have in this sector. Um, uh, that's my, that's my thought on that, Tamsin. Okay, thank you. I'm going to invite you in the audience to think about what your image of success would look like, because I'm asking each of our speakers, and they're going to show an image to you. And at the end, we're going to ask you, the audience, um, both online and here in the room, to vote which of those images speaks to you about the success of the European health data space. And um, before I introduce our next speaker, let me perhaps start by showing you my image of the European health data space. And in a minute, we're going to show you the image I came up with to try and get my head around this thing that you can't touch it, you can't feel it, it doesn't exist yet, but it's very clearly our ambition. And everyone I speak to has a different idea of what it is and how it would work and how you'd use it, etc. So I have chosen this image, and what you can see is the night sky. And for me, each of those stars is a piece of data. On its own, it doesn't tell us anything. But when you start to put them together, where you can look with a telescope that can look and see the wide sky, we can then map it, we can identify the constellations, we can understand the laws of the universe, but only if we have the perspective. The other thing about that, and you can see there's light pollution there, it's hard to see the patterns in the sky if you don't have the right conditions. So when I thought to myself, what does success look like for the European health data space? My image is that it's the night sky. You need a big enough picture to understand it, and if you can understand it, we can get the principles of the way that the universe works. And if we look far enough behind, we will see all of our history. So that's my image. And I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, who sent a video, and that's Amanda Bock. She's the CEO of the European Haemophilia Consortium. And as I said, we're going to focus particularly on rare diseases in this session. Now, the European health data space, even if it wasn't called that, has been a long-term advocacy demand of the rare disease community, because for them, it's absolutely critical that data is networked and federated and shared, because otherwise, there's no hope of a breakthrough for them. And I remind you that for 95% or 94% of rare diseases, we have no therapeutic cures or treatments that are available. So there's a lot of people with unmet needs out there. So let's watch the video from Amanda, and she'll introduce her image of what the success of the EHDS would look like. Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda, and I'm the CEO of the European Haemophilia Consortium. It's my great pleasure to join you, even if virtually, today and to be a part of this conversation. I have been invited to help set the scene from a patient's perspective, and to do so by sharing an image uh, that represents what we think good would look like for the European health data space. The closest thing in nature to the type of efficient and dynamic system that patients want to see is the beehive. As a patient, in this case, a flighted bee patient, I want to improve my life. I want to get something nourishing, something that I need to heal or to stay healthy. I fly off, I find the thing that works for me within a certain range to my hive with a particular preference that is informed by my genetics, but also by information that I receive from other bees in my hive and therefore by our collective experiences, options and choices. 
When I return, I share information from my journey, where I went, how it was, do I recommend it? Because I'm not just interested in my own health, I'm interested in the overall health of the hive, the community that I live in. And other bees go out and do the same and come back and feed back again. And so the information is constantly being transferred, being exchanged, updated, and is evolving. Of course, it doesn't just stay with us, the flight of bees, but also spreads to the queen and to her assistants. Two different analytics feed into the survival and improvement of life in our entire system. The immediate analysis and learning of individual bees and the future focused analysis and learning of the collective bee mind. The queen bee cannot do anything on her own. Both parts have to work together. In this scenario, the flighted bees are the patients. Their exchange of information, well, those are the exchange platforms, such as, for example, the apps. The worker bees are the centers, those that deliver the services and provide the space for future generations of patients slash bees to come back to. And the entirety of the hive is where the European health data space needs to be. We need that coordination. We need it to be collaborative. But we also need an almost direct link from the patient getting their treatment to the queen, the European health data space that sees the big picture. My little bee information dance has to go all the way to the top, but all the way to the bottom at the same time to the next patient. And this direct link between the patient and the health data space is essential for it to work. Data collection is about patient welfare, but data is only one of the constituent parts. We must all remember that our effort should not be just about one of these constituent parts, but rather about the harmony between all the parts. The beehive is a dynamic, interconnected organism with strong feedback loops that is always learning, just like we need our European health data space to do. I hope that this has helped illustrate the patient perspective, our preferences, and our goals for what this health data space can achieve. And I hope it sets the scene nicely for the conversations to follow. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to Amanda, and also for sharing that wonderful image and explaining how the bees interact with each other and the hive. So that's a vision of what a rare disease patient hopes for from the European Health Data Space, a vision for what success looks like for them. I'm going to introduce a number of our speakers on the panel, and they're each of them going to share their picture and talk us through why that makes sense to them. So joining me online, I have Emmanuel Bacri, the Scientific Director for the French uh, Health, National Health Data Hub. I have Dr. Neve O'Connell, the National Haemophilia Director at the National Coagulation Center at St. James Hospital in Ireland. I have Karen Pignacin, the Head of Medical Affairs Europe for CSL Bering. And I have Jérôme de Barros from DG Santé, a policy officer with expertise in ERNs and digital health. So we have a great panel who are going to explore it. But I'm going to start with Emmanuel. Can I invite you to share your image? What does success of the EHDS look like for you? Share it. Sorry, I sent it to you, so... We, we have it on screen. Oh, OK, OK, good. But because I don't see it. So, oh, yes. Uh, so two things before talking about this image. First, it's very hard to find an image. I mean, it was the pain for me. It was really painful. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I wrote down the list of keywords I wanted the image to be able to, to illustrate. And of course, I didn't find an image that, that could gather all the keywords. So I did my best, but I'm not very happy. And I'm very jealous about the bee image. I wish I had this idea, <laughs> because I think that's, that's pretty neat. And, and I, 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 I like the, the, the vision uh, of the European data space as, as, as the, um, that, that, that is brought by the image we just saw. OK, so if I had to talk about the image you see on the screen right now, and the keywords that I thought of, of course, when, when you talk about your own health data space, well, well, you think that health is at the center, so that's why there is this heart. And I think this is, this is important to, to keep it in mind and that everything is really uh, uh, 
around that. Then I guess I have, uh, you know, we all have our biases uh, when we think about Ukraine <laughs> data space, and my job makes me think about uh, practical and technical things uh, that uh, we have to deal with when we talk about that. And of course, there is, and, and I like the, the B example for that because I think it was, it was very neat for that aspect. It's all about interoperability, collaboration, and, and also multidisciplinarity. So I guess that all these words, I feel like these images show you like very different types of things because we are talking about very different types of people involved in that. A lot of disciplines and that they have to work together in some ways. And we are also thinking about that when we're talking about the data interoperability, which is a major uh, aspect uh, that can, so making the data work uh, um, together. And, and maybe an idea of fluidification, also like everything should be fluid. Uh, it should be easy, it should travel easily. I mean, the information and, and the, the benefits for the citizen and, and, for the, and whatever is needed for the researchers and, and, and so on. So I, I like this uh, image because I thought there was uh, uh, some of these uh, keywords, ideas that, uh, that you can see uh, uh, in the image. Now, maybe the parts that I'm missing a little bit in this image, and I wish I had uh, uh, found an image that could talk about that because there are maybe one thing which is very important is legislation. So everything has to be done according to legislation and to according to rules. And okay, maybe my image was not, is not very clear about that, but I think this is one major aspect of European habitat space. And maybe one last thing, that is not shown in this image and that we hardly talk about actually. Uh, and I think we have to keep it in mind is the fact that we have to be kind of green at the same time. We have to be eco-friendly. We have to be careful not to build something that is going to be like a huge thing that will uh, not be good for the planet. And then we have to be careful about that. Uh, and I think that is something that we have to, to keep in mind. So this is my vision. I'm sorry I didn't find an image that, that is totally in adequation of what I've said, but that's the best I can. Uh, uh, Thank I you. Do. Thank you, Emmanuel. I'm sure after our session you will be inspired. And the next time somebody asks you, what's your image of success for the EHDS, you'll come up with uh, an even better image. So now let me, and I'm going to invite you in the audience, if you're watching online or here in the room, if you have an image that you like, that you think shows what you think uh, the successful EHDS could look like, feel free to tweet it and tag the EHFG, and we'll have a chance to look at them later. But for the moment, each of our speakers is going to share their view. So Neve, can I invite you to share, what does success look like for you? What's your image, your conceptual framework for the EHDS? Thank you very much, Tamsin, and it's a pleasure to be here with this fantastic uh, group of co-speakers and yourselves uh, at the meeting. Um, I am a haemophilia treater. I look after people with lifelong health conditions. And here in Ireland, we've been lucky to have uh, a mini version of the European Health Data Space in that we have a national electronic health record for haemophilia and bleeding disorders. And so in a small microcosm, we have tried to emulate some of the uh, aims that the European Health Data Space is looking to achieve. And I would very much welcome uh, such a system uh, from the perspective of a treater. So I suppose I came at this from my own experience in looking after people with haemophilia and also in um, my experience of the importance for patient safety of uh, interconnected health data so that we have access at all times, 24-7, 365 days of the year, to up-to-date accurate information about people that we can then use to look after them. And I include in that not alone the data that we insert from a healthcare professional perspective, but also data that our patients uh, give to us. So the image I have chosen is a painting by an Irish artist called Mark Francis, and he's from the north of Ireland, from County Down. Uh, 
And for 30 years now, he has produced paintings that take from nature, biology, and uh, cellular uh, structures uh, inspiration. And uh, this particular painting uh, is uh, especially rooted in the study of fungi or mycology. And as you can see, there are these, it's an abstract painting, but uh, you can see these nodes that have multiple interconnections in all directions. And I think for me, this is like our haemophilia database, interconnected maybe with the epilepsy database, interconnected with a, a, a information that might be uh, available in other countries if our patients travel, so that there are nodes of data that we retain what is good and excellent already in our healthcare systems. I think the European Health Data Space already acknowledges that we're rich in data in the healthcare field, but what we need is connectedness. And I think that's what this particular image was saying to me. I envisage that there are signals that are moving between these nodes in two directions and in all directions in, in a dynamic way, continually updating, and so that when I, as the treater, have to access information about a person who arrives, as I had this week a patient from France who comes with a bleeding disorder who needs treatment, and we have no information other than what he can tell us about his underlying condition and, and all of the complexities of his lifelong condition that we now have to pick up. So for me, it's about patient safety, it's about access, it's about connectedness, uh, and it's about a, almost a living organism of information and data that will support our safe and high quality healthcare delivery. Wherever our European citizens are treated, uh, whether it's in Ireland, in France, or any other country in the European Union. So uh, I would hope to be able to plug our fantastic haemophilia database into a bigger network so that we can enhance and and increase the quality of care that we're delivering. So that was the reason I've chosen this image and that's um, where I was coming from with it. Thank you very much for sharing another very unique and interesting vision about how the EHDS could work in a way that delivers quality and impact for different people. Karen Pinyashin, let me invite you to come in and share your perspectives. What's your image that you want to share with us about what success would look like? Thank you very much, Samson, and uh, great to be here with all of the panel and, and uh, on-site participants. And my image here, and, and um, I feel we all had uh, uh, maybe the same problem as Emmanuel described at, at the beginning. And I, I was really thinking what, what, how, how to express all of this complexity we also saw in the um, um, in a word cloud, actually, uh, participants answered with different uh, words coming from on one side from positive things, which we are all looking for, but on the other side with complexity and danger and, uh, and, and all issues coming in. And I realized that actually we're not trying to reproduce something which existed somewhere else, and we're trying to do this just bigger, better, and, and, and uh, easier. We're trying to create something which we cannot benchmark from. And I said, probably this image I'm looking for, it doesn't exist anyway. So I, I came with the idea that, and this is the methodology of what I did, is the idea not looking for an image which is there, which is a picture, which is a photo, or which is something as uh, Neve's um, painting, but something which would be generated by artificial intelligence. So what you see now on your screen is not a real image. It's not a place in this planet, at least for sure. It doesn't exist. It generated by one of artificial intelligence image generation programs, the biggest one, DALI, doesn't matter which one. And I did a little bit the same as Emmanuel did. I came with some keywords or tried to describe what I want to see. And then the artificial intelligence system tried to, 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 to generate an image which is, which is in, in there in your, in your screen. And this was a combination of two things. On one side, the direction we, we want to see or this brilliant future we all are hoping for for our patients and for, for the society. And there, a key element is the freedom. Freedom, and uh, we, we work in Cecil Bering uh, in, in space of rare diseases and also in space, uh, hemophilia, where um, Neve is one of traders, Amanda representing hemophilia patients there. And the freedom of living a normal life, doing anything any person without hemophilia could do going uh, in the mountain, going to like going to another country, as Nick just described, going to to Ireland from France or traveling uh, uh, around the world. That type of freedom, which probably could be uh, visualized there by the blue uh, lake there and the blue sky, everything going well, and patients can go and travel everywhere. 
And if there is a problem, physicians in that given country, they will access their health data and manage the problem appropriately without losing anything in the quality of care, despite the fact that you are not in your home country. That's the freedom part. The, the part which actually you don't see because the image actually was a little bit square, that's the artificial intelligence system is generating there. But at the beginning, it's, uh, it's visible already, but it's kind of slippery rod uh, before. There are some stones actually before the leg, so you have to cross this, uh, uh, this part, which uh, looks like uh, uh, pretty dangerous. So you have to go across that to arrive to the leg. So it's not as easy as it may be uh, on, on your screen now to get to, to this brilliant future. So the, um, the calm, beautiful, serene, probably European, because there's a lot of blue also on the, on the screen. So European future in the light and blue sky, but to get there, uh, full of complexities in interoperability of data, in uh, access to data, in patient ownership of their own data, and in uh, also requirements on how to use data, not only for healthcare, but also for research purposes. And one thing which we have maybe today less in Europe compared to um, what we have in the regulatory field on a field of science, we have less of a common European health technology assessment of uh, um, different uh, uh, healthcare interventions. So this is something also which um, uh, today, especially if we come with real world evidence generation field, which are uh, which is requested by many health technology assessment uh, authorities across Europe, those, those requirements are much less standardized compared to, uh, for example, regulatory requirements. We do have one single European medicines authorization or certification for devices, but we don't have one single type of HTA assessment. So um, different authorities, different reimbursement system, different payers may require different type of data. So the standardization also of data, which can be produced uh, by, um, 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 and which can be gathered through uh, European health data space is something also which be very interesting to have in the future. Thank you, Karen. And let's now have our last panelists to share their perspective. Jerome, from DG Sante, what's your vision of what a successful EHDS would look like? What image have you chosen for us? I just realized I've been pretty shame by, by our speakers here. I mean, what I try to have here is an image of not so much about what we have from EHDS, but more if we were to describe it in a way. So I thought of the spider web for several reasons. First, the complexity. It is a complex organism when we look into it. But as we can see, every part of the web is connected. And this is what we're trying to do, making sure each data set, data holders, everybody being connected, making sure it is no invisible to everyone. And plus, you can see there is structure in the way the, the web is spun. So it's also something we try to achieve. We want to make sure that when you are a data user, the process to access this data uh, and to use it is as similar as possible wherever you are. So that's what we're, we're trying to, to convey. And I, I realize I should have probably put more thought into it. Excellent, thank you for sharing that vision. We've, we've now presented you with you with a range of different images and explained why those images are inspired by what the EHDS could be or should be. So now we're gonna get into a little bit more detail about some of the practicalities. We, we heard about the rocky path to the lake. We heard about complexity, the need for things to be connected but also some of the, the challenges. The data has to be always on. It has to be good quality. It has to be fluid. It has to flow. It has to be accurate. Um, it has to be multidisciplinary. So all of these are different things that we need to explore in some detail. But let me, I'll come back to Neve now, because you know, as a clinician, you witness firsthand patients' views about the use of their health data, and particularly for rare diseases. Can you tell us a, a little bit more about what's actually at stake for patients and how you think the EHDS might might deliver real benefits for them. Thank you, Tamsin. Um, well, you know, in, in working with a lot of uh, individuals with haemophilia, typically for me from the age of 16 up until the end of life, whenever that is, um, I guess I see a lot of people who have an enormous history as they go through their lives and 
it is very disconcerting for them to meet doctors who perhaps don't have any of that information. And if they go, even in our own uh, country, if they go from one hospital to another, it isn't always necessarily the case that all of the information is available to them. And that makes them anxious, it makes them worried, it makes them uh, feel that they have to carry all of the uh, information themselves. And uh, some people are very health literate, are very well able to be assertive on their own behalf or have family members who can do it for them. But equally, we have a lot of patients who might be more vulnerable for various reasons, whose education levels may not be as, as good as we might like, uh, or who may have other health conditions that mean that they can't advocate for themselves. So I think what patients want is to feel safe, to feel that all of the relevant information is available to the healthcare professional looking after them. But as well as that, Tamsin, I do think they are very aware of data protection, uh, of the regulations that have come in. Um, we've done a lot of work with haemophilia, the haemophilia community here to inform them about GDPR and the protections that it gives them, but they definitely want to feel that their data is safe. Here in Ireland, we have unfortunately had a cyber attack against our health um, services in the last uh, year and a half, and that has been very worrying for people. So while on the one side, access to accurate, up-to-date data is critical for their safety and well-being, on the other hand, uh, we need to make sure that the checks and balances are there so that that data is protected, both from inadvertent um, you know, uh, usage or from malevolent actors or people who are trying to, to do, uh, to do uh, criminal activities or, or, or illegal activities. So I think you know, both things are important to patients, I would say. And I think the final element that I have seen in our own patients is that they want to have access to their own data. So in the past, uh, we've had, I think, unfortunately, almost a paternalistic approach, which is in the olden days when people had paper charts, literally it was written on the front of the chart not to be given to the patient patient. But it is about the patient. It is about them. It's all about them. And so they need to be able to see their own data. But having said that, also from a healthcare professional uh, perspective, I want to support them when they get access to that data, because in fairness, there could be something in that data that is concerning or worrying or might need further discussion or explanation. So I want to make sure that if patients do have access to their data, that they get support from us as healthcare professionals, so that if there's any queries, concerns or worries, that we can address those with them. So those are sort of the three things. Um, they want safe, effective healthcare. They want protection for their data and they want access to their own data. That would be my experience. Thank you, Neve. And before I move on, let me just ask you if you can pick up on this issue of real world data. Can you give us a concrete example of when you're, you're treating patients, you obviously have clinical data and there's data that's from the from research databases, but how is real world data used by you and then also contributed back into the databases? How does that work? Well, here in Ireland, as an example, you know, we were the first country to move entirely to using a particular kind of um, factor replacement in Ireland for haemophilia, which replaces the missing factor for people with that bleeding tendency and, and means that they are protected against bleeding. And we, when we tendered for those treatments, um, had a lot of information from clinical trials. But as we all know, clinical trials are a very uh, sort of unusual environment in the sense that uh, people people who are very committed and adherent to the rules tend to sign up for those studies and they're monitored extraordinarily carefully, uh, and rightly so. Uh, when you move into the real world, it, it's not that you don't monitor them as carefully, but it's just a fact of life that people uh, are, are trying to incorporate their chronic health condition into their daily lives, so they're not available to maybe have as many monitoring visits or as much um, you know, uh, medical data collected. Uh, and additionally, we are probably using the treatments in a wider group of people than would have necessarily been chosen for a clinical trial. So what we were able to do when we switched over in Ireland was collect data using our electronic health record here in Ireland and we've been able to publish on that um, for the benefit of our own provision in terms of really proving that these treatments that we had changed to are delivering in reduced bleeding rates, in protection from bleeding with surgery and in addition we've been able to do some qualitative research which shows us that the experience of people who switched was in fact better than they had experienced with their uh, previous treatments. So that for us is important to show our 
budget holders and our taxpayers who pay for the treatments, that we are delivering value for money. It's important for us as a team to plan our treatments for the future. And it's important for our, our international community of patients and treaters with haemophilia to show that these treatments are safe and effective even when um, extrapolated to a wider group of people and in, a, in, a, in an environment that is you know, a typical haemophilia comprehensive care centre that might be seen in many countries in Europe. So I think it gives us all confidence, both the patients and the treaters, when we move forward. And collecting that real world data was critical, I think, because otherwise uh, you, you're never sure is the treatment that you've changed to as good as the treatment that you had before or as good as was seen in the clinical trials. But we were able to prove that in fact it was. Uh, thanks, Neve. And we're going to now turn to Emmanuel to hear from France um, and your experience of your health data management frameworks. Because we've spoken a lot about the complexity. We had, it's, it's difficult, it's complex. People have spent their careers and, and invested time and money creating their own little data set. And yet we need to make it work together. And that's never easy. Um, Emmanuel, what can you share of perhaps the painful process of getting people to start sharing their data and building on that? And maybe you want to also touch on issues like the portability or quality. Yeah, so the, yeah, the, share, the sharing the data problem is one of the major problems. And I think it's not specific to France. I think this is something that, that is the case in most countries. And, and at the level of uh, Europe, it's even, it's even more problematic. Uh, there is a valorization problem of the data. You have a problem related to scientific valorization. So when there is a paper published, practically speaking, when there is a paper published, who is co-signing the paper? If you follow all the guidelines, all the international guidelines, the French guidelines and so on, if you are just a data producer, I don't want to minimize the fact that I mean, it's very important to have data producers, but in terms of co-signing a paper, if you are a data producer, you are not supposed to co-sign a paper unless you participated to the research uh, uh, that was made on your data. Uh, so that's the scientific valorization problem. And then you have, of course, the financial validation problem where the, the data producer says, I need money to, to, uh, to standardize the data, to collect the data, to make it interoperable and so on. And that costs a lot, a lot of money. And if the data producer doesn't have enough money, he has to get money from elsewhere. So basically selling the access to the, to the data, uh, not to the academic people, but to the, to the industry. So these are the two bottleneck generally that you would see uh, uh, for uh, that would keep uh, data producers for sharing uh, the data then you have maybe another one which is i would say more problematic to me which is the fact that some of them would like to control the database and that's it because they don't want they want to to decide what can be done and what cannot be done. So this is a little more problematic. Now, uh, the two other points are real points. I mean, this is, uh, this is something that we have to address. Uh, and convincing data producers to do so is, is not easy. It's something you have to do and you have to discuss, you have to explain, and you have to come up with some solutions that, are, that fit uh, everybody's needs. Uh, that's also why we are in France big, uh, I mean, very, very big lobbyist for the government to finance uh, in a permanent way some of the major databases so that the data producers would not have to just always look for uh, uh, financing and for, for money to, 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 to be sure that they can uh, uh, produce the, the databases. Today, the, at the Health Data Hub, we are in close discussion with, let's say, about 100 data producers that are totally ready to share the data. So that's good news. Now, there are a lot of them in France that do not want to be part of the Health Data Hub, to tell you the truth. They don't want to share. Uh, but my belief is that, uh, I mean, as the time goes on, the fact that a lot of the data producers open the data now and they understand and we are making up the rules and Europe is going to make up 
different rules also that will fit all the needs and so on. My belief is that it, people will understand and will be less. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, you know, also a lot of fears that um, just because it's a new system, it's a new way of, 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 <laughs> of uh, working and people are just afraid of changing their ways of working. So I think we are going in the right direction and that people will more and more open uh, 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 their data, but we have to explain what it is for, how, how they will get finance, how valorization will work, and there are still some open questions. The valorization about scientific valorization, we can find some ways, but uh, financial valorization, it's still a very big problem. And uh, even if we look at the, the legal, uh, the draft of the legal uh, text that was published by the European Commission, it, 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 it acknowledges the fact that it's a big problem, that it has to be discussed, and we have to come up with some rules, but uh, it, the rules are not clear. The rules are really not clear. And, uh, but this is a, a major issue. Now, you wanted me to comment on what else? I'm sorry, I didn't remember. I, if, I did, just wanted to give you, I mean, you, you gave us a lot to talk about, and I'm actually going to bring in Richard in a minute to, to give a perspective from Sweden on some of the things that you spoke about. But I wanted if you could uh, just touch on the issue of quality. Yeah, quality, so quality is a big issue. You could put quality, standardization, interoperability, all this stuff. It's a lot about uh, working on the data. So it's like uh, working on the data so that, so that you're sure that the data is good and, and that you can, and that you know what it is about. I mean, you know how, how it was built and that you can put it together with some other database so that uh, we are talking about the same thing. Let's, let's give an example. Uh, in, in France, at the very beginning of uh, COVID, the first wave, we, uh, we tried to gather a lot of emergency uh, databases in order to monitor the epidemic, the pandemic. Uh, and uh, we were facing a very, very big problem which is that uh, every emergency service was coding COVID in a different way because we didn't have any tests yet at that time. So some of them decided to code COVID when there were some symptoms. Some of them it was these symptoms, some of them it was other symptoms. Some of them said, no, I don't code COVID if I'm not sure it's COVID. So if you do so, well, there is no way you can make all these databases work together. There is no point to put them together. So there is no way you cannot do anything. So you see, it can be as simple as that. It can be much more complex than that. But it is even, I mean, this is a simple example because it's easy to explain, but it's a very hard to solve example. Very, very hard. I mean, we did not succeed in, some, in solving it. You cannot say to all the, the doctors in France, this is the way to code COVID and this is how it's gonna work. That, that doesn't work. I mean, doctors, they, they think they, they know their way to do the job and they don't want to receive uh, orders from the government. So this is a, a very uh, important matter uh, that has to be addressed within each country and at the European level. In the, in the pilot, we, we are at the hub, we are, we are uh, leading um, a, a very wide consortium with uh, eight national uh, uh, platforms EMA, CDC, Elixir, VBMRI, a lot of a lot of very very important institutions, to uh, operate the pilot of the European data space, mm -hmm. and so we are start we are about to start, and I can tell you that the the work packages related to uh, standardization, quality of the database, and so on is one of the major work package. It is okay. it is the base. So we, we should come back to you in a year and find out how you've managed to solve that. In, in two years. Two years, okay. Watch <laughs> this space, we'll one come back. That, even, I mean, two years is, is already kind of crazy, but one year that would not- That would be too much. I mean, impossible to do the job. Richard, let me bring you in on that. We just heard, uh, and I think it's an interesting issue that we might pick apart a little bit. He said there are two key challenges here that relate to money. Mm. Number one, it costs money to create 
a database and maintain the data and clear out the old data and sort it out. So there's the investment and upfront cost in the collection of data. And the second aspect is when the data has a value and a financial value, it's perhaps clearer and people are more comfortable with that when it's, it's used for scientific research, but what if it's then used by companies for products that they can make money from? We don't really have rules on that, it's very unclear. So I know this is close to your heart, what would you like to comment yeah. on that? Yeah, well there's uh, so much to say. First, so Jerome, I hope you're taking notes uh, because uh, uh, you get now an inventory list of uh, challenges uh, for the Commission and the Council and Parliament and all the stakeholders. But I think everybody, all on this panel, we're enthusiastic, I think, so one should misunderstand that. But, you know, there are clearly uh, issues, right? Um, so I, I think uh, if we can attract, uh, and I know most people here are from the life science sector here in Gastein, if we can attract also all the energy and money from tech, it's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, they've all been struggling. I, I, I think they say that on Wall Street, that nobody's making any money on digital health. Mm -hmm. uh, and why is that? And one reason, and I'll come to that now, is quality, you know? And Emmanuel touched upon it, you know, asked the question, you know? And I'll quote uh, Eric Topol, a thought leader in the, in the US. Uh, I'm sure many of you follow him as well, you know? Uh, I listened to him in a podcast, and, and he was asked this question, you know, when you apply AI, and the whole point is that sometimes you, you cannot explain it. You know, there's no causality, but AI tells you something. Like, for instance, some wristwatch tells you to go to the emergency room and have an MR scan, you know, because something's happening in your body. <laughs> so you got this question, okay, uh, you, you don't know, what is it it's reacting on? This algorithm is reacting on something, a composite of measurements in you, history of lab data, maybe some sensors and, you know. Um, and then he paused for a second, and Eric Topo said, well, I guess so. That's the whole idea with AI, is that, you know, that it, it coaches us and helps us. But, he said, but then I need to know that that AI algorithm was trained on quality data. So I think this is extremely important for all of us that know the space. It's one thing that pharma companies know very well that real-world data is not always clean. It's not a clinical trial. You're not chasing the data points with monitors that are traveling around the hospitals, you know? So you know that you have empty data fields, you have the point about coding, uh, you know? Uh, um, so, so, so the pharma industry and medtech industry sort of know about the, the in, incompleteness of real world data. But many of these tech people that I, li when I listen to them, I mean, they're so enthusiastic and fascinating people, often very younger than me on top of that, really cool people, they don't know this. They think that, you know, they ask, give them the data and they can do anything with it, right? So I, I think that's a very important insight into making sure that particularly when you apply things to, 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 to AI, right? The, the other issue that Niam touched upon, you, you didn't use the term portability, but if I use that term, it's about, and I have two challenges, you know, one is, of course, you know, in, 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 in Ireland or elsewhere where we still have maybe paper records, the challenge for patients to bring data from one source to another is not because people are against it or they stop you. It's just that it's a, it's a challenge practically, maybe, okay? Um, and we don't have that issue with single-payer systems. We don't have competing health plans and so on. But we also have, when the, when the private sector comes into this space, uh, the, the tech guys again, uh, you know, the issue of portability if I start then training or generating information on my devices, how can I bring them to another device or even bring them over to my, to my GP? I mean, you know, you know, governments had to force mobile operators by law that you were allowed to keep your phone number. You know, I mean, that's a, isn't that the simplest portability there is, right? And I'm struggling now with moving my contact book from one version of iPhone to another one. You know, uh, so, so you ha really have issues, uh, particularly when you move, come into with technology that the private sector operators may not always want to let you move your data to other people. So I think this is yet another uh, item on the, on the list, Jerome, that we have to be uh, aware of when, when we put the whole framework in, into place. 
Thank you. And I know we've already got some really good questions um, in from the audience, and I'll be coming to them in, in just a moment. Karen, if I could come to you now to pick up the industry perspective. We heard a little bit uh, of insight there from Richard, but can you tell us a little bit more how industry could benefit from the secondary use of data? And also, what would be the hurdles in collecting the data? We heard about some of the challenges, and, and Neve talked about data being a two-way flow, information coming in from the patient, clinician, and flowing back to them. What's your perspective? Thank you, Adams. And I, I may start with hurdles, actually. It's easier, uh, probably, to, to find them. And I think one of, one of key elements um, and uh, key issues we are facing continuously is the question of why. So why people will have to collect data and why patients will be providing their data, why physicians and uh, treatment centers will invest all of those efforts with all problems uh, uh, even Emmanuel described and what we will be do, doing with this day afterwards. Uh, when you do a clinical trial, it's very clear. You do a, a, a clinical study and you get your data and in phase one, you get your proof of concept. In phase three, you get your uh, um, uh, drug uh, uh, marketing authorization file. You submit, you get, you get a marketing authorization. In the case of real world evidence, it's, it's much less easier for us to be 100% clear on why part. So what we will get out of data afterwards, once we collect the data and we will, what we will be doing. Are we able to submit data to regulatory agencies to have data highlighted in our uh, drug uh, files in the summary of product characteristics for, uh, for, for Europe, for example? Are we able to prove to um, healthcare technology assessment or uh, reimbursement authorities that there is a particular benefit, not only on, from the clinical perspective, but also from health economics perspective, to use this drug rather than um, no intervention or rather than something which is uh, different from, from the approach. I think once is the why is, is clear, um, it's much more straightforward to go and ask people to invest some um, substantial amount of efforts in, in data collection. And if I go back to the point on uh, what we can do with data, yet definitely uh, one of one of elements is um, making clear that physicians and also um, the uh, larger society um, and, and different decision makers they do understand what is the advantage of uh, taking this or the other type of um, health intervention, and during uh, the uh, evaluation of those health interventions. The, the use of real-world evidence is today systematically required by um, health technology assessment agencies and reimbursement authorities, sometimes even as a precondition on uh, reimbursement, sometimes uh, as um, the, um, the element which would be required to be submitted or collected during years of uh, uh, reimbursement and submitted to agencies afterwards. And, and the element um, I would like to, uh, uh, to bring in, the example actually is um, we are entering now in many therapeutic areas, and especially and um, let's say critically in the field of rare diseases, in the era of uh, uh, gene and cell therapies as a one-time treatment. In, in most of cases for now, most of uh, gene and cell therapies are authorized for one-time use. And in this case, when we, have, when we were in the previous paradigm situation, uh, a chronic disease, patients are treated lifelong, and there is a pretty easy logic, no, not, not fully uh, acceptable always, but pretty easy logic, you are treated lifelong, so data about the treatment efficacy should be collected lifelong. It kind of makes sense. You're regularly getting treatment, and then the efficacy and, and, and safety of the treatment should be evaluated regularly. Now, we are moving sometimes in, in, in some therapeutic areas uh, and with um, some diseases into one-time treatments. And the paradigm is very different. You get one-time treatment, but you may need, and it may be a regulatory requirement, it may be a um, payer requirement, it may be scientific interest on you get one treatment and then the data about the safety and efficacy of that treatment are collected for many, many years and sometimes even lifelong. Well, lifelong is very young, long when you are 18 from uh, you know, going for, uh, the example gave me with hemophilia patients. So this why part, why anyone would be willing to contribute 
uh, to the data collection with these hurdles and why industry will be able to ask or to insist sometimes that yes we need this data so um, the, the, those two ways I can personally imagine uh, how to increase the how to make this more visible is on one side uh, bring, being more clear about what we will be doing with that why part and then on the other side decrease the burden of data collection I think this is something which uh, we, we already mentioned about the seamless data collection and this is I think one of most important hurdles because uh, as an example when we started to um, since uh, last couple of years to talk about the need of um, systematic data collection in the case of uh, gene therapies for example we, we didn't realize that actually everyone wants data collected and submitted for them. It may be the national uh, registry, the international registry, the local hospital system, the national payer, the company, the within the company, it may be the uh, safety department, uh, people looking after the efficacy. So everyone wants data, actually. And the, here the point of uh, interoperability and um, portability of data is really very, very clear because one of the things which um, we definitely hear from uh, treaters like uh, Nifhe and, and Panel is that no one wants to enter the same data uh, 10 times in 10 different systems. I think how easy this could be, and this is a very practical reason because we can think about with those um, uh, brilliant tech guys uh, Richard mentioned about what to do with data, but if the first line person, the treater, and maybe in a real world situation, the first line patient can, uh, person um, can also be the patient, not necessarily the treater. If those two first line persons are not collecting data, well, there is nothing to operate. There is nothing to deep dive into. There is nothing to feed into artificial intelligence system. The example I always have in mind, one, once one of those um, you know, techie companies um, came to, to me to pitch an idea of generating great out, uh, insights from um, data collected there, uh, and we are working in rare disease space with the very rare disease sometimes. And the example he, he brought here was based on Alzheimer's disease. I said, you do realize that there is like million times more information in Alzheimer's disease is one of the most common diseases rather than if you compare it with, for example, hemophilia B um, type of patient. So if no one is collecting data with the lower burden of collection and with a high level of understanding of why this is important, then we have nothing to operate with. Okay, thank you. So clearly you've outlined some of the challenges about the level at which the data is collected, the clarity and the use of the data. Um, Jérôme, I'm going to come to you and I'm actually going to pull in some of the questions we've received from the audience because I think they're, they're useful for you already to pick up on. And they're partly to do with the EHDS as the pioneer globally. Richard, earlier you said that you know, the GDPR was a tough and controversial issue to negotiate, but then it became the global standard. And we're being asked, you know, how could the EHDS be a beacon or a pioneer? Is it going to be connected to other parts of the world? From, could people integrate or, or consult it? But then if you think about our neighboring country of Africa, which is also starting to develop a health data policy, to what extent could the EHDS be um, a in source of inspiration for the way they develop their frameworks? So, Jerome, it's perhaps a bit unfair to, to give you these questions straight away, but could you reflect on that, the extent to which the e it's hard to develop a path for the EHDS because it's the first time a continent tries to do that, but could it then also be open and accessible beyond the EU? under what rules, and could we also support colleagues in Africa to develop their own um, health data space? Because African health data is so invisible in our global health data. Jerome. So I would say there are, there are different steps that we need to be taken, and, and our priority, as you can imagine, is first for the HDS to work for, for the member state. To, uh, and for that, we obviously build on what's already existing. We already, whilst we were developing the proposal, we obviously consulted and took inspiration from frameworks, from practices, best practices that already are happening in, in countries such as France, for example, uh, with uh, Emmanuel's uh, Health Data Hub in Finland, but also other countries. So the idea was also to, to start building on, on some of the good examples that we, that we could find. We do believe that some of the underpinning principles that are part of the HDS, making sure that the identity of patients is always preserved, that the data is, uh, when is made available, is always done in a secure environment, somewhere safe, where um, 
no data, no personal data can be extracted or principal examples that we believe should also be considered and implemented in, in other countries. More practically, we, we do foresee in the proposal uh, the participation of other countries, of other countries outside the European Union. So uh, always on the basis that they do comply with the safeguards that we we, we, we proposed in, uh, in the HDS. The idea is also that if such access or collaboration with the countries takes place, it would always be on our following, let's just say, our, our, our guiding principles and, um, and provisions. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, maybe I could also bring in uh, Emmanuel and Richard on this from a, from a national perspective, because we've got a couple of questions that I think are, are relevant for that. So we've got a question about to what extent has the GDPR been a hindrance to sharing of health data at EU level, partly because it's interpreted differently um, in different member states. So um, Emmanuel and Richard, would you like to come to that? And Neve, there's a question I think that would land on your desk, because it's, you know, to what extent does the EHDS concretely impact the patient's rights for rare diseases? So, Emmanuel, start by this question. Is the GDPR a problem because it's applied differently, or is that actually creating a minimum I basis that opens it up? Yeah, I would not sum it up like GDPR is a problem. No. Uh, the basic is that GDPR is a good thing. Now, uh, it's not surprising that such a move as a GDPR, when you are doing such a move, it's hard to do the right move, the exact right move uh, for the, you know, at the first step. So GDPR has some weakness and, uh, and for health data in particular. So it, it let the countries some freedom to how to organize the data and the, the legislation to access the data and so on. And now it's too heterogeneous. So it's not like GDPR is, is bad. GDPR is good, but it's not enough for uh, European uh, health data space. Now, let me just comment one thing about the extension to uh, more countries. I think there is one thing we can learn from the COVID. I don't, I don't know if you remember the, the big affair that, that was around the Lancet Journal when there was this publication uh, made by a startup that was claiming that they, they gathered data from, I don't know, like 60 countries or like a crazy number, and, and they proved that hydroxychloroquine was, had no effect on COVID. Because of this publication, France and WHO, they decided to, uh, to stop giving hydroxychloroquine, which was now we can say which was a good move, but it was extremely clear for many people that the, the study was bad. There is no, nobody that can run such an experiment on real world data at the level of the world on 65 countries. I mean, this is totally impossible. You have major interoperability problems, major legislation problems. If you do so, it's, you can be sure that you are not doing it in the legal framework, this is pretty clear. So I think this this uh, thing tells you two tells two two and can learn two things from that thing. The first thing is that we can we can I mean we can do really great things by being interoperable at a very very large scale. So it's very important to okay we are now trying to build something at the level of Europe, but it's extremely important to start discussing with all the other countries at the same time, because it's going to be a major uh, issue of be, to be able to conduct this kind of stuff in the, in the framework of the pandemic, because real world data is extremely important, especially for pandemics, but not on. Now, the second thing that we learned from that is that it's extremely hard. So we really have to, to work at every level, at the level of each country. I mean, there is no, I don't think there is a single country that can claim that its data is interoperable at the, level, at the national level. Then we, can, we have to work at the European level and we have to work at the extra-European level. 
Thank you. Richard, would you like to comment on yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, so first on Africa, it's interesting that there's some precedence here because the uh, European Commission member states are funding this EDCTP network for clinical trial capacity in, in, in Africa. So I think, you know, let's think about something in the real world data space too, you know. Uh, fully agree with Emmanuel on both points. <laughs> first, GDPR is, uh, we should be very happy we have it. Maybe it's a bit of a challenge for the legislation and then the various national groups to keep up with technology. You know, because particularly when you get into AI and, and big data triangulation, you know, then it's much more complicated. Um, uh, now, on the, 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 la the last point, of course, I've been uh, engulfed by COVID-19 for the last uh, two and a half years, and I couldn't agree with more, more with Emmanuel, because having also a regulatory background, uh, we have some hardcore colleagues, uh, I call it that, you know, that insist that the only evidence there is is randomized, prospective randomized controlled clinical trials, and any other evidence is not worth anything. Now I think there's been a big recognition that is observational studies, big time, real world data that actually drives even decision making and policy making. You know, we, are, I'm part of the European Commission team buying the vaccines, right? So, you know, we bought vaccines for dose three when we heard from Israel and America that probably this is a three-dose vaccine. We didn't have any studies for that. It was well, observational studies. Mm -hmm. Same thing with those four and those five, and now we have some clinical data for the variant vaccines, but you know, we're moving quickly to even this latest variant, BA4-5, based on lab data. So, so I think people have come to realize and have to acknowledge that the policy making has to be based on, on certain standards of evidence, but then we have newer types of evidence coming, which actually takes us back to the quality of the, of the, of the data. But I fully agree with Emmanuel that, you know, uh, outmoding hydrochlorochine and other things, you know, was, was extremely important. And, and, and those, that data didn't come from traditional clinical trials. Let me, I mean, the one thing about COVID is it was global. So we had a huge amount of data generated very quickly. The big challenge in rare diseases is they're such small patient groups, and the, the data is like pearls. They come from uh, small amounts you know, over time. So you, you've, you've said that there's been a shift in the mindset of the regulators, and people have now understood that we can generate and use and process data differently. How could we look at that for, so that it benefits the rare disease patients, where it's always going to be? Yeah. small data sets. And even if you federate it, it's still relatively no, small. No, but, but you said it in your in introduction, times, and you're absolutely right. I think the, of, of all the spaces, of all the conditions, you know, the area that will benefit the most, we will all benefit, but we will really ben benefit the most from functioning European health data space is rare diseases. Because it's about, uh, you know, it's a drug discovery, it's figuring out what's going on, substance biology, and all of that, you know, uh, it's about access to broader sets of data. It's about finding patients for the trials yeah. and then finding them for actually deploying the innovation. And then, and then to the point made by, made by, by um, Karim here is the, the fact that you actually need systems to follow up. You need payment models as well that are linked probably to longer term outcomes. Do you need to retreat? Do you need to give these inhibitors? So, you know, still need to get factor product in your case, in your case, right? So I, so I think, uh, particularly in this space, uh, we can benefit. And I, I hope we can rally uh, all the, the, the patient groups and all the various associations engaged in rare diseases to be, be strong proponents for this proposal without, without proposing crazy things. You know, we need to make sure that what comes out is, is robust and, and maybe an inspiration for the world. Thank you. Neva, I promised to, to come to you to particularly pick up on this new issue that was raised about patients' rights. Um, and rare disease patients' rights, how would they be impacted positively or negatively through the, the proposals for the EHDS? Um, thank you, Tamsin, and I'd really echo what Richard just said. I mean, uh, when we look at clinical trials in haemophilia, we might have 50 people in a trial, and we think that's fantastic. Whereas, you know, I think people in other healthcare areas uh, would probably find that very difficult to believe. But uh, you'd be surprised how much very important information we can get out of those small numbers, because we can, we can do some very in-depth analysis of those patients. And we have to, because that's what we have. And the other thing I think that's worked well in the haemophilia world has been, for example, the European 
European Haemophilia uh, Safety Surveillance System, or UHAS, where we as a community pool our, for example, adverse events so that we can see the patterns that are arising. So I might only have a small number of patients in Ireland, but if I put them together with my colleagues from across Europe, then actually we can get some good and informative data, just as Richard has alluded to, which allows us to make good decisions around um, safety of treatments for patients. So we've, I think we've proven it in haemophilia. I would have to say that I think um, the haemophilia community is a little bit ahead of maybe other rare disease areas. And one of the things that's been alluded to is resourcing. And I think governments are going to have to resource um, the rare disease communities to bring them to the level that, say, haemophilia is, is at. Because, you know, as Karen has alluded to, if we're not putting the data in both patients and treaters, then, you know, for example, something like the UHAS system that we have for haemophilia adverse events is meaningless because we don't have enough. Whereas actually what we do know is that we all submit our data and we do it very diligently. So we can, we can be assured that it is the totality of the information. And I think it just emphasizes the importance of collaboration between the patient and the treater communities. But you know, in, in the sense of how, what rights can be supported by this, um, I'm really encouraged to see that finally, after many years of sort of ad hoc development of registries and databases, that now for the first time I'm hearing that people are going to really put some structure on it. And this is what the European Union does so well. Uh, you know, GDPR, just alluding back to that in terms of health research, you know, it, it wrecked our heads for about the first 18 months as to how we were going to do our observational studies in hospitals, which we had been used to doing with, you know, with not too many um, burdens in terms of the paperwork. And for the first while, it was very burdensome, but we've gotten used to it and we've gotten systems and we know how to do it now. So the point is that once we get our structure in place, the regulatory environment is clear. Uh, if the governments put the resources in to helping other rare disease areas, as well as haemophilia, to upscale and to get the uh, various data sets together uh, and provide us with ongoing resources to curate, analyze, and keep that up to date. Um, and there will be, I think, a will on the part of both patients and treaters to very much uh, embrace this as uh, really upholding the rights of people with rare diseases to have really high quality data on their health uh, on an individual basis and then on a community basis as well. Thank you very much, Neve. As we're coming towards the last you know, 10 minutes or so of our conversation, I want to see which image you chose. We presented you with a series of images, and so let's see the results. Some of you have been voting throughout that, and we presented you with a series of images. And the big winner there, 39% of you are going for image three. 28% uh, were going for image five. And in a minute, we'll go back to see which ones they are. But clearly, the person who presented image number three gave a very eloquent uh, description about why that image was chosen. And so there we can see that image number three, and it's perhaps no surprise, it was the patient vision of the dancing bee and how it shares information and how the hive comes together. Hive can only collaborate um, in order to achieve it. Image number five, oh, it's the night sky. People liked my night sky image, that's great, okay. So uh, image number one, which was from the Irish artist, which talked about these you know, connections and new learnings being made all the time. So thank you for sharing all of your insights and ideas about these different images. When we talked about this session, we, we came up with this idea simply because the EHDS is, it's a phrase that people talk about, but really it's very hard to conceptualize it because it doesn't exist yet. And that's why I thought it was quite interesting that Karen put forward an image that was created by a computer because it didn't exist yet. He gave it some keywords and asked it to come up with an image, emotional words like freedom and complexity, and that's the image it came up with. So thank you for that. But clearly, the very well thought out and beautifully described image of the bee and the beehive is the one that has spoke to most to your hearts and minds. In the uh, last few minutes, because I see we've got um, about three or four minutes left in this session, I need to try and pull out some messages and link to the theme of Gastein this year, which is the moonshot. You know, can we have a moonshot for health? Can we, um, you know, join the dots to tackle rare diseases to reach that moon? Uh, Neve gave us very clearly how important it is 
for patients and clinicians in the rare disease area and how they have been developing their databases and sharing data, perhaps for the longest of all of our patients. But we heard about the complexity and the difficulties. We've heard about some of the conceptual questions about who's supposed to fund it, who's supposed to manage it. How do we deal with the fact that at the end there will be a value created by that. It might be a scientific research value, and we're all more comfortable that that goes back to the community and that this thing called the body of medical knowledge will grow. But then what happens about the fact that actually that data is going to provide a financial benefit? And where and how should that financial benefit fall? How should it be shared? Who should then own it? Is all questions that I think are still very much up for debate, and we talked about it. Um, amongst the questions that came forward is, you know, things like the GDPR, it's a good thing, it's a first step. There was lots of room for flexibility, but perhaps too much flexibility. So finding that sweet spot between a regulatory framework that everyone understands and then giving people the ability to engage with it. And we talked about the challenge at the beginning of COVID that nobody quite agreed on how to code, code for it, so people were putting different information, and lots of data was being generated, but you couldn't get quality insights out of it. So we still have this message, and I think it perhaps comes back to the issue of trust. The person at the front line who's putting in data, whether the patient themselves, or the nurse at the bedside, or the specialist who's treating them, we have to trust that that data is being encoded and managed and is of high quality so that as it flows into the system, we use it to create understanding that we have this connection through it all. So coming back to making the link to the moonshot, and thank you for all for putting your ideas in here. Going to the moon was both incredibly ambitious but also something that you know, could unite everyone is an idea to move forward. There's nobody, I think, who thinks that the EHDS is a bad thing. We all know it's going to be difficult and complex, and there'll be mistakes along the way, there'll be failures. But the prize, putting a man on the moon, is the prize of an EHDS that works, that generates new insight and understanding, that revolutionizes the way we understand medical science, our biology, our interactions. And we, we didn't even touch on this, actually, in our conversation, that the way that health data has to be linked to environmental data, to economic data, because they're all part of what affects our health. It's the first step towards the major digitalization of society. And we're making attempts at it at European level. And this is something I think, uh, as a health community, we need to watch how it goes through the European Parliament and the European Commission, because many things get lost when they get negotiated by committee. Trade-offs will obviously have to happen. I'm sure, Richard, you remember some of the political trade-offs that happen at, uh, at other levels. We need to build on the experience of countries like France that have been a forerunner that have tried to do it and tried to put it in place. There's a different approach in France to that taken in Germany and other countries, so we need to find ways of bringing that all together. But I want to say a warm thank you to those of you who joined us here physically in the room, those of you who joined us online, Thank you very much for sharing your questions and comments, which I hope we brought to our experts, and for voting on the image. I hope you go away and think about that image. When you leave the session, if somebody says, you know, was it a good session? You say, yeah, I voted on some interesting images. Please share those images and your ideas. I haven't looked at the Twitter feed. It may be that people suggested other images, but I encourage you to do that because it gives us a, an easy frame of reference with which to start talking. Because otherwise, the HDS is hard to describe. It's hard to conceptualize and move forward. And we do have this great quote from uh, Timo Wolken, a member of the European Parliament, who, of course, is acting on this, and he's saying that it's a crucial forward-looking proposal, um, and we can over, only overcome these health challenges by doing it together. Same message that Amanda showed with the bees. A single bee alone cannot make honey, it cannot create a hive, it's only by connection, but it's the accuracy of the information. So this is a message from uh, Tiemma Wilkin, and thank you, we thank him for sharing that image. Um, can I say a warm thank you to Richard for being with me and my panelists who joined us all online. That's to, to Neve, to Jerome, to Emmanuel, and to Karen. To you for being part of this conversation. You know, rare diseases are a small community, but they're very active. And this was a small group here, but I think it was a really lively and excellent exchange. So thank you, Richard. Thank you to the panelists and our newsroom crew who were curating some of the information and kept flagging for me. Tamsin, there's great questions. Look at it. 
Thank you all, and I think the next thing is a coffee break. Thank you.